Hi guys, Dr. Dillard once again. It's time for our Monday's GIGU lab. Today we are going to do palpation of the abdomen. And we're going to talk a little bit about how to palpate the abdominal aorta. And we're going to talk about what appendicitis looks like in a couple of tests, Rolfsing sign and things like that. Here we go. Palpation is used to detect muscle guarding. Deep abdominal masses. You can use it to evaluate the size and shape of organs, like mainly the liver. The spleen's pretty hard to find. You should stand on the right side. Seidel's board book recommends that. There are two types of palpation, a light palpation and a deep palpation. Some basics. Always warm up your hands. Remember to put a some kind of a pillow under the patient's knees. That'll help relax the abdomen. If the patient's ticklish, that's always tricky. And you can put their hands under the area you want to palpate, and then you palpate through their hands, which is not always ideal, but eventually they'll get used to you, hopefully. If the patient has specific regions of pain, which you should have asked a long time ago, then this is the point. You're going to palpate those, but do those last. Just remember what we are palpating through. There is a lot of muscle, and there's the rectus abdominis, and all the subcutaneous tissue and fat's been removed, so it's just to show you there's a lot of stuff to get through. All right, light palpation, think circles. So you're going to palpate all four quadrants using these gentle circular motions with your fingers, exactly like this. Start in one quad, the lower quadrant, and search around. We'll sh I'll show you a pattern you can use for this. Make sure you get in each quadrant, though. And this is not a deep palpation, so you shouldn't go any deeper than one centimeter. You're really searching the skin and the subcutaneous tissue, and that's about it. Scan every nook and cranny of those quadrants. You're looking for masses underneath the skin. Lipomas are really notorious for hiding in here. You might be able to feel one of those very superficially. And watch, maybe the patient's got some pain. Maybe a lipoma's painful or, or something. Well, I always watch their face to see if they grimace. They want to be tough and they won't want to tell you they have pain, but they might grimace and you go, hey, did that cause some pain? And you know, talk about that more. Okay, you do a kind of each, each do a sub quadrant search in each four of the quadrants. I mean, you can break a. Let's say here's your here's your four quadrants. Uh, you can actually break this quadrant up into four little quadrants, and you can ser search each quadrant uh, using this method. That works for the the lower quadrants quite well. Well, the upper ones are more like this though because of the costal margin. So you kind of have to do like a triangle pattern in those will work pretty good. And you'll swirl your little circles, checking every nook and cranny. So here's kind of the, the deal you can see. And there's no order, right, to do this. You can the bottom line is make sure you get all every nook and cranny checked. Got it? What are you looking for? Any inconsistencies, any knots, any rigidity? Now you shouldn't really be going deep enough to to feel the muscles. So, I mean, rigidity is more with deep palpation. Uh, but if they have appendicitis and you start start even soft palpation on the right lower quadrant, they might cringe and they might start acting a little weird. And when you go into deep palpation, then you can feel the rigidity and a lot of pain. They won't probably won't let you poke in there very much. But note any masses, lipomas under the skin, uh, areas of tenderness, things like that. Involuntary muscle guarding. Now this is again more with deep palpation, but what is it? And sometimes it's called rigidity. This is an involuntary response. They can't control it, um, but their rectus abdominis muscles and the flat muscles, the external oblique, internal oblique, transversalis, or transversus abdominis, those are the, called the flat muscles, or those are the ones on the side. They can go into a reflex spasm to protect an area that's inflamed, like if an intestine is inflamed or you, a bowel is inflamed from blockage or an infected diverticulum or whatever, it can go into quite a spasm. And uh, 
that's a protective type, almost like an antalgic patient comes in bent to the side of the rectus spinae or spasm to protect the disc herniation, something like that. Same kind of same kind of deal. Okay, no matter how hard you try, you can't get the patient to relax. These patients, I mean, are going to be very sick too. You'll probably not be coming into your office. They'll be in the emergency room. But, but in the emergency room, you can use these techniques to kind of get an idea of what's going on. Uh, voluntary spasm, that might be, I mean, they might be faking it. They might be ticklish. You have to judge the other symptoms. Are they sick? Do they have a fever? Have they been throwing up? You know, if, they, if you can get them to relax, then it's usually not quite as serious as an involuntary spasm. Involuntary spasm, you start thinking they might have peritonitis. If they have voluntary spasm, maybe they have an inflamed bowel or appendicitis just starting. It hasn't gotten that bad yet. You, but to be voluntary spasm, that has to be a spasm, and you coax them and get them to relax. You can put maybe another pillow under their knees, see if you can get them to relax. Causes of tenderness, we said inflammation. If a organ is inflamed, like the liver or, or the appendix, or an intestine is inflamed, it's going to hurt like heck when you push into it. Those nociceptors are all, all set off so easily because they're inflamed. So that's the cause of it. It could be from obstruction as well, obstruction like a beaver dam in the bowel. The bowel kind of backs up and it starts to push the intestine out, uh, the intestines out, the circumference increases, plus bacteria, if it's not moving, they start breeding and releasing gas, and the, it can blow that intestine up to the point it's the stretch receptors are stretched out to the max and painful. You poking on them will just set it off even more. Remember, you might get some hyperactive bowel sounds as well at this point. You can get your stethoscope if you suspect obstruction you can listen early obstruction you'll have hyperactive bowel sounds lots of clicks and gurgles uh, if it's late really late bowel obstruction you might hear nothing it could be completely shut down okay um, specifically there's one thing I want you to uh, look out for uh, we talked about Cullen sign uh, Gray Turner sign before those are more observation, but here's one you might have to you can see and palpate, and this is the Sister Mary Joseph's nodule. It's not a good thing. It means a metastatic carcinoma from somewhere in the abdominal cavity. Could be colon cancer, uterine cancer, pancreatic cancer, anything in that region. The lymph nodes drain into that. The lymph nodes underneath the umbilicus and they can swell right up. It can look fake people out because it can look like an Audi belly button, but it's not. It's rock hard. An Audi belly button, if you've ever messed with one, you can push on it and push it right back in to where it came from. Same with an umbilical hernia. As long as it's not strangulated, then it's going to be super painful to the touch. But if a little Audi belly button with a little intestine in there, you just push it right back in. No, uh, no problem. Uh, but these things you can't. They're rock hard, and that's not a good sign. Okay, they usually indicate malignancy from the pancreas or large intestine, some kind of inter-abdominal primary cancer that's metastasized. Very bad sign. Uh, one source I read, actually, it's in Bates, said the survival rates are only 11 to 12 months. This patient has got stage 4 carcinoma. And they don't look, I mean, that looks like just a little herniation, but that ended up to uh, be a Sister Mary Joseph's nodule. That one doesn't look right. That's definitely not an Audi. That's hard as a rock. Hard as a rock. Those are definitely not umbilical hernias. I think they have a little fluid draining out of this one. Uh, but you, those are not good, right? You know, to send immediately to the, uh, to the hospital, get those things checked. All right, deep palpation is just what it sounds, but you're no longer going to use the circular pattern. Uh, you're going to use a back and forth pattern like this with your fingers, not a circular pattern like that. And this one's going to be pushing down pretty deep. You'll be checking all four quadrants again. Should scan every nook and cranny, although I don't think you're going to be able to get away with every nook and cranny. So go right in the middle of each quadrant to start just so you get, at least you get... 
the four quadrants in, they might not let you do this because it doesn't feel that good. But if you can get all the quadrants in, great. You're going to be pushing down much harder this time. Uh, so you're pushing down. You can even use two hands if the patient has quite a bit of adipose tissue. You can push two hands down there. Uh, there's that same pattern. If you can do that, great. But I mean, I would start out with just going back and forth like this, back and forth like this, back and forth like this, back and forth like this. And if they didn't have a problem with that, then you can start to do the other quadrants if you want. I mean, in reality, well, no, you really should. I mean, if you really want to do this right, you should search every quadrant. I don't think anybody ever really does that. But they definitely want to go at least once in one quadrant. I mean, you just order, if you suspect anything, you order MRI or ultrasound or CT. Uh, warn the patient this might be uncomfortable because it is uncomfortable. And you push down, you move your fingers back and forth, as we said. Uh, and sometimes, especially when you're getting near the liver, uh, you might have the patient take a little breath in and blow the air out or exhale. Remember that as you blow the air out, the diaphragm goes up and it gives it opens up the abdomen a little bit uh, bigger. It makes it a little more squishy. All right, so there's the diaphragm just and you can see the other stuff that's in there. So when you blow take a, when you blow the air out, remember the diaphragm goes up. Right? And then when you take a deep breath in, the diaphragm goes down. We'll use that next week when we palpate the liver. You can drive the liver right down below the costal margin if you have a patient take a deep breath. But there's a thing. We're talking about this appendix here. That's such a common structure to become plugged and inflamed. The gallbladder as well. You get deep pain right in this region. You suspect gallbladder. Down here, McBurney's Point, you suspect appendicitis. Uh, liver would, or the spleen would be underneath here coming out. But you can also get, I mean, poke into the stomach if you have a gastritis. And one of the gastritis, as we talked about in the last in lecture, uh, the stomach will be painful as well. All right. I should have warned you. I can't see the slides coming like I can when I'm really lecturing, so sorry about that. Uh, but, yep, that's just a pretty fresh cadaver. And there's all the appendix. How do you, or what do you think of that gallbladder? That's definitely swollen up, right? It's been, it's probably got stones in it. It's been, stones have plugged up the the neck of it, and it's got infected, and the stones have released. It's got affected again over and over, and they can get, they can get. I've seen ones way bigger than that in some of the cadavers. Okay, uh, again, it's it's diff it's normal for it to cause some pain. I mean, they shouldn't have screaming pain when you do this. There, there's something wrong. Again, if they're obese, you can use the two-hand approach. There's the two-hand approach. Okay, if you do find something, if you find a mass or an area of real bad tenderness, make sure you write down everything about it. Uh, you might send the patient to the hospital and they don't do anything, but then when you do re-exam in four weeks or so, you'll have these notes and you know, get an idea of the size. Is it pul if it's pulsatile, they better not blow it off. At the hospital, it shouldn't be pulsatile. It's probably some kind of an aneurysm, unless you're over the abdominal uh, aorta, which we'll look at here in a second. You should also note down if it's intraperitoneal versus extraperitoneal. In other words, it is is it above extraperitoneal? Is it above the uh, peritoneum or below inside the peritoneum? It's kind of hard to tell that intra versus extra, um, but you can have the patient, let's say you palpate a little nodule, it feels superficial, but you want to make sure, have them contract their rectus abdominis muscles, just have them lift their, their head and maybe shoulders off the table, that's enough to contract the rectus abdominis, uh, and see if it disappears. If it disappears, that means it's a deep, more of a deep mass. If it doesn't disappear, it's more superficial. That's probably a lipoma or something like that. All right, this is important. Lots of stars here. So you always want to do this test, especially in males, smokers. But anybody over the age of 50 should have one of these just to make sure. Normally, the abdominal aorta shouldn't be greater than three, middle, uh, three centimeters in size. Okay, three centimeters. 
So it shouldn't be gigantic underneath there. It should be not in exactly in the midline, but just a little off to the left. I'll show you exactly here in a second. You're going to sink your fingers down about an inch apart, 2.54 centimeters is an inch. So about an inch apart, maybe a touch more, but we'll keep, we'll keep it at 2.5 centimeters for now. And you should be able to feel it. Uh, in most people, if, they've, if they're really muscular or if they're uh, quite obese, then you have trouble finding it. Uh, but this is exactly how you do it. So you push uh, down. I think his hands are a little far, uh, further apart than I would like to see them. You don't need them uh, to be that far apart. I would keep them a little closer. Once you find it, then you can spread your hands apart to see, get an idea of how big it is. But you literally sink your fingers down there. You can have the patient exhale as well to... Because uh, the diaphragm is there's costal angle, so you can have them blow the air out, exhale to lift that diaphragm up and give you extra wiggle room, and you got a decent chance of of palpating this. If the patient's really thin, you might actually see this with your own eyes. Sometimes you can see it pulsating. What are some risk factors for abdominal aortic aneurysms? Male smoker, greater than 65 years of age or equal to, especially if any somebody in the family, immediate family, has had one of these repaired. Uh, the okay now appendicitis. Let's jump to that. So this is an important thing. You will run into this. Uh, here's remember the anatomy. Here's the the distal part of the ilium right here, and then it goes. It connects through this little orifice. The ileocecal valve is how the the fecal material is squirted into this little sac. This is the ascending right here. It's the ascending aorta, or aorta, ascending colon. Uh, and this little sac down here is the cecum. The appendix comes off the cecum. And there's a little, it's, it's a hollow tube-like structure. So it's considered a diverticulum. Anytime you have a hollow tube extending from another hollow tube, that's a diverticulum. And then there's a little orifice, so there you could put your finger in there. There's a definite connection there. And inflammation of that appendix is very dangerous because that appendix is pretty wimpy. The it has it's there's a hole, right? There's a lumen inside here, so the walls aren't that thick. And what happens if you get a plug right here? We'll show you in a second, but this thing can swell up, it can become infected, and it can rupture and spill all that pus out into the peritoneal cavity. And now you've got yourself a rip roaring peritonitis, and you can die. It can slip into septicemia, and that's that's no joke. Appendicitis. People die from that every day. Okay, so uh, by far the most common cause uh, of the deadly peritonitis. It's an appendicitis is an inflammation of the appendix. Again, we said it's a di it's a diverticulum like structure hangs off the lumen. How does the what's the pathophysiology? I do like this question. I used to have people explain this to me. But what's the pathophysiology of the appendicitis? Well, it's it all occurs when that lumen gets blocked. So there's a an ostium to the appendix that's normally open, so you can there's free communication but if that gets blocked with a some fecal material especially with seeds mixed into it it makes it really hard if it gets blocked it'll cut off the venous outflow from the appendix right because the appendix looks like this let's say this is the wall of the appendix and this is the regular old lumen here of the ascending colon and that's going up like that but if you get a block uh, right here, like a fecal material gets in here and plugs this, well, then you got a problem because you have veins draining. This is living tissue, so you have veins draining this. Uh, and if this gets blocked and kind of smashes the walls here, you can't get the blood out, and then this starts growing bigger, right? It's swelling up now. The walls are swelling. You also have... You also have arteries in here, and now the arteries are going to get, they're going to get pinched as well, right? So there's arteries. Remember, arteries have tougher walls, don't they? They're harder to smash. Veins are wimpy. You can crush those easily. But as the pressure builds, 
these veins or these arteries can now get smashed. Now you can't get blood in, and this tissue is be, going to become ex ischemic. On top of that, you got the darn bacteria in here having a field day because they're no longer flowing. They're stuck, and they're they're multiplying like crazy, breeding like bunny rabbits. And uh, they take over. They get into the walls, and they can burst the wall, and you can get all that pus and exudate leaking out of the appendix into the peritoneal cavity. And now you're in trouble. Uh, this, the appendix... The appendix is surrounded by its own type of um, peritoneum as well. So that can immediately cause peritonitis. It doesn't have to be the parietal peritoneum uh, that gets inflamed. It can be the appendix peritoneum that gets inflamed. It's got like a parietal peritoneum. I think it's parietal or visceral. I can't remember if it's visceral or parietal, but there's, uh, you can get peritonitis right there. So. That's kind of the story, what happens. There's a little better drawing uh, where a piece of some fecal material had a really high sesame seed. I'm just, it can be other seeds, too. It's not just sesame seeds, but uh, it made a really hard paste, and it blocked this, and now the bugs down here can't get out, and uh, everything I just said happens. A very dangerous situation. Can you imagine poking into that with your fingers? The patient's going to jump off the table. It's going to hurt so bad. All right, everything I just explained to you. Okay, how do they present? I do like this slide, don't I? How does this patient with appendicitis, and it can be many different ways, right? This can fake people out, but usually, typically, they start, the pain starts right around the umbilicus. So they have a diffuse pain around the umbilicus, and that means, ah, it's there. Now, it's not there. It's kind of, it, it's just a vague pain. But then as with another three hours go by or six hours, now the pain shifts over to a place called McBurney's Point. Uh, and if you, uh, here's the patient's laying face up. Here's their belly button. Here's their ASISs, anterior superior iliac spines. If you draw a line about two centimeters is McBurney's point right there, right lower quadrant. If the pain isolates to there, they got a decent chance they got appendicitis. So it started around the belly button and then it moved to McBurney's point. And you can have them do a Valsalva's maneuver. If that increases the pain, increases the chances of having appendicitis. So there's McBurney's point. It's two inches. Did I say centimeters? Uh, it's two inches from the ASIS toward the umbilicus. Uh, let's see, was it Rubens? No, it was Robbins says it's actually a third of the way. So they need to get their signals. Uh, their signals are crossed there, but I'm going with Bates. This is the oldest board book, so we'll go with Bates on this one. Robbins is pathology. Bates is more clinical. Uh, so we'll use two inches from the ASIS toward the belly button. That's McBurney's point. You have to know that. Palpatory findings, so local deep palpatory tenderness could indicate appendicitis as well if you poke into there. They will also have voluntary, if they have involuntary spasm, that means the peritoneum is probably inflamed, so that's not a good thing. So they're going to have some muscle guarding with this. Now there's a couple signs you can do. I mean, you don't want to go poke your fingers right into McBurney's point and do a rebound tenderness. That's cruel. Board books actually talk about that, how they really don't. That's just, we have other ways to tell now. You don't have to poke your fingers into McBurney's point. You can actually work on the left lower quadrant and see what's going on there. So Rolfsing sign, uh, it's very important. you got to know that. And it's pushing. Do I have a picture of it? Oh, man, I, I keep forgetting to put a picture in here. I make a note picture. I say that every quarter. I used to have one I cut down the slides and I took out the pictures. Um, but let's let's draw our little, our man here. Okay, so there's the legs. It's a face-up view. There's the belly button. Okay, there's our quadrants. There's McBurney's point right there. So you're going to work over here. It's where you're going to push your fingers down. 
So you're going to push your fingers slowly into McBurney's or into uh, that left lower quadrant. I guess I drew on the wrong one, didn't I? And then just push it down and hold it. If it recreates, if pushing down over here recreates pain at McBurney's point, they have a very high chance they have appendicitis. That's called the positive Rolfsing sign. Okay, it's not a rebound test. You're not going to push down and then all of a sudden release your fingers super quick. That sends a shock wave through the peritoneum, and if the peritoneum's inflamed, uh, they'll it'll really hurt them. And the books uh, talk about they don't want people doing that anymore. It's cruel and unusual. Uh, but Rofsig sign is enough, so just push down, and it does indicate acute appendicitis. They need to go to the ER if you have a patient with a positive Rofsig sign. Uh, rebound test for appendicitis. Now, you can also, in the left lower quadrant, you can push down, and now you can release quickly. So that's a rebound tenderness test. That's not Rofsing's. That's a rebound tenderness for appendicitis. You don't do this over the suspected appendix. You know that's going to hurt, but maybe that's a bowel instruction. You're trying to see if the peritoneum is inflamed because uh, by, by monkeying around in the left lower quadrant, you're stretching the peritoneum. And if you stretch the peritoneum in the vicinity of the appendix, it's inflamed. It's going to hurt. Not where you're pushing your fingers in, but over on the right side. right? So that's it's just like Rolf's things, only you're going to quickly release and see what happens. If you want to increase the specificity of the test, it was just positive. How have the patient bear down? Uh, okay, I want you to hold your breath and push down real hard like you're constipated or like you're going to deliver a baby or on the last push. I want you to hold your breath and push and see if that increases the pain. Uh, if it does, it increases the likelihood that they do have appendicitis. They go right to the ER. Alrighty, so that'll do it. I'm going to see if I can get my wife again to, uh, she hasn't been feeling good, but I'm going to try to get her to do a, do a, if she's feeling better, to do a demonstration for you. All right, see you in the next video.